Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Muller, uh, and today I would like to talk to you about the process of creating two social impact games that I've worked on, a normal lost phone and another lost phone lower story. These two games are games where you found a phone and you have to find out what happened to the owner of the phone by looking through the different applications, uh, reading the emails, looking into the gallery. They are presented as investigative games, but through storytelling, they make people think about important themes such as homophobia or abusive relationships. We sold more than 200,000 copies of these games. And uh, these games also had a real impact on a large number of people, as you can see from different messages we have received. This game helped me come out of the closet. This game made me realize that I was homophobic and that I had to change. This game has helped me accept my past. This game made me realize I was too jealous and I had to work on it. All these different reactions are what I call direct social impact. Someone plays a game whose objective is to make them think about a subject, and this game provokes a direct reaction. I will give you some advice on how to uh, design uh, games with a direct social impact in the second part of this talk, but first I would like to talk to you about indirect social impact. Indirect social impact is the fact that any creation, whether we intend it or not, will have a social impact on its audience. To take a more personal example, when I was a teenager, I read a lot of mangas. On one side, I read a lot of shoujo's, mangas for girls. In these mangas, there were always girls looking for Prince Charming, and also looking for the best way to satisfy Prince Charming. At the same time, I was reading a lot of shonens, mangas for boys. And in the mangas I've read, all the boys were presented as sex maniacs, without exception. I was quite young, and I didn't have much perspective yet. And these two parallel readings pushed me into the beginning of my love and sex life with two beliefs. First, my role was to find Prince Charming and to satisfy him. That's what I have learned from the shoujo's. But also, I had to accept all its sexual desires because all men were sex-obsessed, without exception, including Prince Charming. That's what I have learned from the shonens. If you want my opinion, it was really not the best way to start young adult life. <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is not that mangas are evil and that I regret having read them. Not at all. What gets me thinking here is that I'm not sure that the authors of this manga were living in Japan, were thinking about the influence that their works could have on a French teenage girl. And that's indirect social impact. Every work we create has an impact, and as authors, we have a responsibility to think about the creation we make. Our responsibility as authors is not a choice. It is a fact, and we cannot ignore it. That's why we have to make at least inclusive games. Making an inclusive games is an approach that consists in thinking about the impact that each creative decision could have and seeking to limit, as much as possible, any potential negative impact. Making inclusive game is essential, but it's not the same as making an activist game. To make an activist game is to make a game 
for which you intentionally seek to express active support for a cause. It's not something that you should feel compelled to do, because it's risky, both commercially and militantly. Commercially risky, because it will hinder some people and potentially generate less sales. And militantly risky, because it's, it's really hard, actually, to make a good game with real impact. I will therefore give you some advice and tips that we used uh, for a normal loss phone and another loss phone lower story. The first particularity of these games is that unlike other games, you are not asked to play a character in which you do not recognize yourself and with whom you have difficulty identifying. In this game, you play as yourself. You are the one who found the phone. You are not the owner of the phone. You are playing yourself searching through a lost phone. This means that at no time do you find yourself playing a character that doesn't look like you, and you should never make them choose from proposals that you don't like at all. Here, the, choice of, the choices have already been made by the protagonist. And you are just asked to try to understand what prompted the protagonist to make those choices. However, these mechanics had some failures, especially in the first game. In order to have more interactivity, that is for gameplay reason, we had set up an unsent draft mechanic. That is, at times you come across messages that have not been sent, and you must send them to receive a response that contains information that allows you to move on to the next part of the game. It's something that really caused a problem for a lot of players, and rightly so. They didn't like interfering that much in the character's life, and they were disturbed by the message that could be implied, that it was okay to search and interfere in someone's life. This is a negative impact that has not been considered when designing the game, nor had it been brought up during playtest. One of the reasons I don't think anyone gave us feedback about these problematic issues is that all the people who tested the game were people who knew us directly or indirectly, but and mostly, most important, they, they knew our intentions. Since those people knew that our intentions were good, they didn't perceive the possible bad consequences of what we were doing. This problem on the first game helped us better think the design of the second game, and three major changes were made. For starters, at the launch of the game, we added a message to remind people that the game is a work of fiction, and that in real life, we must not invade anyone's privacy. It's interesting that we had to put this type of message in uh, the game, because in an FPS, for example, you rarely see messages saying, actually, killing is wrong, please don't do it in real life. But since searching through a phone it's something much more widespread. I'm sure some people in this room have done that. It becomes a necessary reminder that it is not something to be done in order to avoid trivializing it. The other change in another lost phone is that there are never any drafts to send. When we thought about it, we found other gameplay mechanics to help the story move forward. And we realized there are always other solutions. The last change we made in another lost one was the end of the game. There are three ways to end the game, and one of them is 
actually a completely valid, valid way, but then the game is really, really short, is that you open the game and then you erase the data from the phone and you don't look through anything. And there's even an achievement for that because it's a noble way to play this game to decide not to play it. Another advice I would like to give to people who want to develop games with a social impact is to choose your bottles. Um, could you raise hands if you are planning or if you worked on a game with a direct social impact or, or if you want to do it one day? Okay, that's a lot of people. Uh, good, I congratulate you. You all want to change the world, that's amazing. So, uh, I wanted to tell you that if you try to open the player eyes on a lot of different topics at the same time, it's a guaranteed disaster. Think of it as glasses. If you give glasses to someone who is not used to wear them, it will take them some time to adjust. If you give them glasses with very thick lenses, it will give them a headache and they will remove them right, off, right away. Activism is the same. You can't expect that overnight, thanks to your game, your audience will become super awake on all subjects. I therefore advise you to focus on a subject that is close to your heart, to make this the main theme, and for the other subjects that are important to see, instead of having an activist angle, having an inclusive angle. For example, in a normal law firm, we never talk about racism because it's a heavy, complex subject and it cannot be approached as lightly. However, we try to at least have an inclusive angle on this issue. We have very different characters and at no time do people use racist insults, for example. Another example, I like to talk about animal exploitation issues, which are important to me personally. So in an animal loss phone, there's a secondary character uh, that talks about it. But it's just a little anecdote in the background. The protagonist has a friend who is vegan, just like they have another one who likes board games. In another lost phone, in Laura's note, we find a recipe for stuffed zucchinis. The recipe turns out to be vegan, but there is no mention of any time that it is specifically a vegan recipe. However, there are players who try to reproduce the recipe and therefore they ate vegan uh, that day. You want to make a social impact game? I advise you also to avoid having a moralizing gameplay. Avoid having rules that in the game that do not allow the player to move forward until they agree with the message you are trying to convey. In the Lost Fun series, players are never told that they are wrong to think as they do. This allows them to continue and finish the game. In character writing too, we try not to be too many can. Characters who have a vision of the world that we do not share, well, these characters, they have other qualities. And this is important if we want the people who actually think like these people to connect maybe with them and to not feel too attacked when after that we say that, you know, maybe you shouldn't think that. To make a good game, in absolute terms, it's necessary to do playtests to check if the game is understandable and pleasant to use. I'm a big fan of playtests. When we make games with social impact, we also need to do playtests to test this social impact. And in order to do this, you have to playtest your game with uh, people who know a lot about the topic you 
are talking about, and also people playtesting the game with people who don't know anything about it. On a normal host phone, what we did is that we ask people to play the game, and after that to explain the story of the protagonist from A to Z. This made it possible to discover misunderstanding and the need to explain in detail certain points that seem really obvious for us. For example, it's really silly, but we realize that some people don't know what LGBT stands for. Uh, for us it was obvious, but it made us realize that we had to add at some point at the game someone explaining what it is, because it's not obvious for everyone, especially people outside the LGBT community. Also, testing the game with people from the LGBT community raised some other problematic issues on the game in relation to the message we were trying to get across. There was indeed a part of the game where we talked about the suicide and murder rates of LGBT people. This information was not false, but we were told that this could lead some teenagers not to come out because of fear, which was not our goal, so we removed this part. A normal loss fund was first created during a game jam, so a large part of the story was created in 48 hours. This means that there were no pre-production process with actual time to reflect on the message we wanted to convey. So a prototype was developed and then shown to people from the LGBT community in order to improve it. On another lost phone, however, we wanted to take the time to do some research before writing the script. We knew we wanted to talk about toxic relationships. So I spent several months reading a lot about it. Essays, scientific articles, autobiographies, even some novels. I then contacted the Victim Support Association to ask for their help. It was difficult at first to convince them to work with us. Like, what, you want to make a game about abusive relationship, about domestic violence? We had to explain that games can be used for something else than just entertainment. Finally, we managed to convince them by showing them videos made by famous YouTuber on a normal loss form, and by showing them all the comment section of these videos on YouTube, and all the people saying that the game helped them. That's, why, that's what convinced all the organizations to say, oh, okay, interesting way to change the world. We'll try to do that with you. In terms of process of writing, whoops, sorry. <laughs> um, we had made progress on the scenario in a gradual way. Step one, we asked the organization to think uh, the subject, how it should be addressed. On the issue of abusive relationships, we were told that what was most misunderstood by the majority of the population was the way the cycle of violence works. Google it after the presentation. Which explains why so many victims do not leave the person who abuses them. The other thing that is often misunderstood by the majority of the population is the importance of psychological violence and how it precedes physical violence. Once we had these important elements, it allowed us to choose the approach to the story. We had to write a story that would explain the cycle of violence and that would focus maybe on psychological violence. So then I, I wrote a one-page synopsis outlining Laura's stories. This document was studied by the organization that was helping them. 
And they corrected some points to keep us from falling into cliches. Once a new synopsis was written and approved, uh, we worked on a walkthrough of the game and we asked them to review it. The walkthrough of the game, it was a slower story, the same as in the synopsis, but with more details and especially it was showing the order in which the player would discover the different uh, parts of Laura's story. Again, with this walkthrough, we worked on the details together. And it was only after that this walkthrough was written, proofread, that we set about writing the entire story. This method was very effective because it allowed us to know exactly where we were going without having to write wall parts of the story and then finally remove them as we done for a normal loss form. We have some time for a question, but I really hope that this talk has helped you to think about the design of your games, whether you want them to have a direct social impact or whether you know it will have indirect social impact. Um, and there's a mic somewhere over there, yeah, for the questions. And if you could start by introducing yourself, it would be great. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm working on a um, similar project where we're trying to create an AR experience, but working with stakeholders in um, Native American communities. And I guess my question is, if you had presented this idea to, say, victims or people that are allies or working with those victims, and they had said, don't do this. Would you have changed your course, or like, how would you have approached that? Um, I guess, well, that's what they did, actually, first, right. the organization. They mm -hmm. say, oh, why do you want to make a game? Mm -hmm. And then we, we ask them why they think it's not a good idea. And by understanding why they were thinking it was a bad idea, we and realized that they were not understanding what we had in mind. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, talking more, try to understand why, and uh, it, it's difficult to answer. No, uh, I know. Like I'm hypothetical. In the, in the same boat things. right now, too. <laughs> uh, we've gotten a lot of support from the community, but also we, we've sort of developed something, and now we actually have to take it back to them. And I'm a little apprehensive because I'm like, what if they, you know, like it could derail a lot of the work we've done. But I mean, the goal has always been to work with communities to amplify their voice not necessarily to put our own spin on it, but at the same time, we have sort of the keys to the kingdom in terms of the technology, you know? Yeah. So. Well, you have to work with them uh, from the A to Z anyway. Um, Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name's Sam. I'm a software developer, uh, and I've done a lot of like outreach activities um, with like students in schools from like low-income families. And one of the things I know from that experience is uh, there's a difference between knowing the facts about like learning like, hey, like, you know, maybe I should do this or should not do this versus like changing behavior. And I was wondering like how your team worked on that, like for your games, like to actually, uh, did you address trying to change player behavior or did you just really want to ex help them be exposed to what homophobia could be and what it means? Um. I'm not sure I understood the question, so if I don't answer correctly, please ask again. Sure. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, please, just could yeah. you ask again the end oh, of the question? No worries. Um, so uh, a lot of times uh, when you're wanting to change behavior of people, um, especially like in a case of uh, like abusive relationships, a lot of times people will know that, hey, like this isn't a good thing and sometimes it's hard to identify, uh, but that doesn't necessarily change their behavior and that's certainly a very complex, difficult challenge. So I was just wondering like how you, if you tried to address that in the game and if so, like how did you approach that? Okay, so now I understand it's a very interesting question. Uh, on another Lost from Laura story, we, one of the first questions we were asking ourselves is, why do we do this game? What uh, impact do we want to have? 
and uh, we were saying, thinking on, are we making a game for the victims? Are we making a game for uh, the abusers? And uh, why, when we talked with the organizations uh, that help victims, we realized that it was more interesting to uh, try to make a game for the people who might know other people who are in abusive relationships in order to teach them how to react. Because that's the majority of the people, like uh, maybe some people here are in an abusive relationship, and I'm sorry for that, but I'm sh but that would be a small portion of it. But I guess all of you, you know someone, or maybe you don't realize it, who is in this position. So uh, that was the goal, trying to uh, teach people to spot abusive relationship and give the right advice, understand them better, understand how the cycle of violence works, uh, remind them that there are organizations that can help this kind of stuff. All right, thank you so much. Any other question? Hi, thanks for the, the talk. Um, I was just wondering, you said that um, one of the things that you were focusing on was allowing people to make choices from perspectives that you didn't necessarily agree in um, or agree with in the game, so kind of honouring the alternate perspective from what you're trying to teach. And I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Like, how do you kind of encompass a, a divergent view from the message that you're trying to get? Like, how do the people that are making those choices kind of learn from the game? I'm sorry, I'm still not sure I understood the question. So, sorry, I thought that in your talk you were saying that um, that you allowed players to, to play the game from different perspectives. So there might be people that were making choices that you wouldn't necessarily agree with. No, in we, the game. we don't do that. That's the opposite of what we're doing. Uh, we're making a game where the player has no choices to make. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> right, okay. Sorry. Hi. Uh, my name is Daniela, and I'm studying game development. And I had like a very interesting uh, project. I'm from Mexico, and there's a lot of like corruption there. So my project was about corruption, and it was really hard because, like you said, you can't force the player to see like your perspective and agree with it. But um, where do you cross? Like, no, where do you draw the line? You know, because. I wanted to make the players feel the way, like, let me think about it. Like when you're in disadvantage with someone because of the corruption and the abuse of power and stuff. But I, like, for example, um, we had to like force the players into that perspective, but because without giving us, without we giving them that like character, they couldn't like see the issue, you know? And I think there was an issue with the game because of that, because players didn't connect really with the character, but like where do you draw the line between like giving the perspective you want the players to see and giving them the freedom to really connect with the game? <laughs> um, I think the answer would be playtest uh, in order to find this line and um, also maybe uh, use warnings at the beginning of your game, content warning, Tarika warnings. I'm not sure if that helps. Uh, I yeah. <laughs> um, I have time maybe for one last question Thank and you. after that, uh, if people want to keep asking questions, uh, we will do it inside because we have to clear the room for other people. <coughs> Cool. My name is Gabriel Ladauto. I make uh, learning games for kids. Um, cool. I, my question is about the mechanics that you use. So you said in the initial game you didn't want to um, do the sending the drafts. What, if you could just talk through a couple categories of mechanics that you used in the game to replace that or just how do we think about mechanics in this style of game? 
Okay. Uh, well, the idea behind the sending the draft was to be sure that uh, the players have access to different parts of the game at different moments. Um, it was inspired by a friend of us who had a bad experience with the game Hero Story, where they got to the end at the first minute uh, and they, they didn't enjoy it. So we wanted to have a system so that you f even if you feel like you can read everything, uh, in reality you have to read that part first and do something about it and then you can access the rest of it. And uh, the answer draft looks like a good idea at the time. Uh, and what we did in the second game is instead having more uh, password protected parts uh, and these passwords uh, they were always um, you always had to have some information that you have read somewhere else to f find the password so um, that's how we did it um, well thanks a lot uh, please <laughs>